Two of Ireland's most infamous sisters commit a heinous and gruesome crime. One that gripped the nation and the world. This is a solved case and it's one I wanted to cover for a while. It's different from the usual unsolved ones I cover. The Scissor Sisters, they are from my hometown in Tala, Dublin. And I remember the reaction of the community, vividly. Everyone was in shock. They couldn't believe two people from their town could commit such a gruesome crime. Now enough blabbering from me, and let's just get into the case. Today's case brings us to Dublin, Ireland, and to a place called Summerhill, in Dublin's inner city. It is one of the most densely populated and economically deprived areas of the city, and the inner city has the highest crime rates in Ireland, so approach with some caution. But like most counties, you will come across for the most part friendly people. So embrace the people and the culture. The shopping is good and the nightlife is better. If you're in the city, be sure to visit the General Post Office on O'Connell Street. The museum tells the story of the 1916 Easter Rising and it still bears the visible bullet holes from this historic event. To fully understand this case and the story, we need to go back to the beginning and explore the backgrounds of the Mulhall family. Marked by abuse and dysfunction, they grew up in a working class area in the south of Dublin called Talla. As mentioned, I also grew up here. Talla is a rough working class area, and while I had a great childhood with great friends and great family, and a fantastic support system, many didn't. Parents John and Kathleen Mulhall raised a family of three boys and three girls, and John was allegedly abusive to Kathleen, but they remained together for quite some time and the relationship eventually fizzled out. But they remained living in the same house. And the upbringing of the six kids, it wasn't ideal. Their parents would partake in drugs and alcohol in front of them, and this was on a regular basis. And this would cause a lot of bad fights, and for all the children to see. In 2002, Kathleen eventually moved on from her marriage, and she began seeing a man named Farah Suella Noor, and he was a Kenyan immigrant. He moved into the family home with Kathleen, while John was still living there. But John soon realised this living arrangement it wasn't for him, and so he moved out. But he didn't go alone. Some of the younger kids that lived in the house, they decided to go with him, and they would rent various properties in Dublin over the period of a year. But when he found out Kathleen and Farrell moved to Cork together, he took this opportunity to move back to the Tala home. And in 2004, Kathleen and Farrah moved back to Dublin from Cork. They didn't like it there, and they were starting to fight a lot. Both of them started to realise each other's personalities, and they didn't like it. And as the story goes on, we will see why. Farrah Noor arrived in Ireland in December 1966. He claimed to be a Somalian named Salim, whose family had been killed in the Civil War. But investigations revealed that he was in fact from Kenya, and his name wasn't Salim, and that his family, they were still alive. So the Department of Justice, they led him to be deported, but he appealed this, and he won his appeal, and he was granted stay in Ireland in March 1999, on the grounds that he had become the father of an Irish-born child, even though he had previous convictions for offences including intoxication, threatening and abusive behaviour, and assault. You see, in 1997, he met a mentally disabled Chinese girl in an arcade called Dr. Quirky's. This was in Dublin city centre, and he forced herself on her, and she later gave birth to his son, who he had never met. He would also welcome another son in 1999 with his then-girlfriend. She was still in school and she was in third year. This would make her 15 or 16, and the two of them stayed together for two years, but she later left him due to his violent and his brutal beatings that he imposed on her. And then he threatened he would kill her. Now when I was researching this case, in the back of my mind I always wondered, why the parents of this girl, this school girl, would let her go and be in a relationship with a man who was double her age? Farah Noor had later faced eight charges of disorder and assault, and one of these charges involved him SAing someone with a knife. And the knife was found at the scene by the guardie. He was then convicted on three of the eight charges brought forward, but he had never served time in jail for any of the things that he had done. Farrah lived in a number of areas in Dublin, 
as well as the inner city before moving in with Kathleen Mulhall. The Gardaí would describe him as being violent towards women. Not only was he suspected in several assaults, he was also the prime suspect in the unsolved murder of Renard Murray. This is a case I covered before, and it took place in September 1999, and authorities did investigate, but they were satisfied that he did not carry out this murder. Personally, I'm not so sure. Farrah was living in the same area as Renard at the time. I'll put the video on screen now, which will be in the top right hand corner. By 2005, Kathleen now in her mid 50s and Farrah, who was 38 at the time, they were still living together in a flat in Summer Hill, which was in the inner city of Dublin. And on the 20th of March 2005, it was a bank holiday weekend, Kathleen with her daughters Charlotte and Linda, along with Farrah, were drinking alcohol in Dublin city centre. And here's some background on Kathleen's daughters for context. And then we will pick up right where we left off. Linda Mulhall was 30 years old in 2005. She was unemployed and she had left school early with no qualifications. And she also had four children. She had no longer been with the father of her children, but she got into another relationship with a man who was abusive to her and the kids. And this led him to serve seven years in prison. And this also led social services to take the kids off Linda for a time as she was addicted to heroin and she was not capable of looking after them for a good stretch of her life. Charlotte Mulhall was the youngest of the two and she was 23 years old in 2005. Like her sister Linda, she also had a history of drug and alcohol abuse. She had a number of previous convictions for criminal damage and public disorder offences and she was charged with criminal damage and given probation in October 2005. Now back to the 20th of March and the day of the crime. This day started with the sisters Charlotte and Linda having a few drinks together in their Tala home. It was a long weekend in Ireland and most jobs would be shut on a Monday. So the pair decided to celebrate. And then they called their mother Kathleen and decided to meet her in Dublin City to have a few drinks together. And there Kathleen and Farrell met the pair on O'Connell Street just by McDonald's. And from there, they would go on to indulge in plenty of alcohol, but not at any of the pubs that were on every corner of every street in Dublin. Instead, they would purchase a bottle of vodka and mixers and drink, take drugs, all while walking around the streets of Dublin. And eventually, an argument would break out. And it was between Farrah and Kathleen. And they decided the four of them would just go back to their flat in Summerhill and continued the night of drinking and party. When they had the music playing which was Sean Paul and the drink flowing, Kathleen decided to crush up an ecstasy tablet and put it in Farrah's drink without him knowing, so he could be on the same buzz as the rest of them. You see, when they were out in Dublin City, Kathleen, Linda and Charlotte, they all took an ecstasy tablet but Farrah didn't. And now he would be on the same level as them. And as the night wore on, Farrah was getting handy with Linda trying to make her sit on his lap and he was doing this right in front of Kathleen and Charlotte. He had no shame. Linda was trying to make him stop but he wouldn't let her go. She shouted for Kathleen to make him stop but he still held a tight grip onto Linda, refusing to let go. And obviously Kathleen didn't take too kindly to this. Herself and Farrell broke out into a huge argument and this made him make a threatening gesture toward Kathleen. And this is when she said to her daughters, kill him or he will kill me, which in turn led Charlotte to react. She went to the kitchen and she got a Stanley blade, but she only got the Stanley blade to threaten Farrah. But he didn't take it serious and at this point while still holding onto Linda, Charlotte then struck Farrah with the blade across the throat and this led him to fall to the ground and stumble around, but still very much alive. As he tried to get up, Charlotte again slashed at him with a knife. And at this time, Linda had got her hands on a hammer and she began hitting him over the head a number of times. All while Charlotte continued to stab him all over. And at this point, he was stabbed at least 27 times and he had died from his wounds. Whilst all of this was happening, Kathleen was sat in the sofa smoking a cigarette. And when Linda and Charlotte came out of the bedroom where the attack took place, they said to her, he's dead. They sat there for a bit realising what they had just done, and then reality hit. They realised there was blood splatter everywhere, and blood all over the carpet and the walls. 
So they dragged his body from the bedroom to the bathroom and they began dismembering him. And this was with a bread knife. This would take them hours and Kathleen stayed in the sitting room not wanting to witness this. When they had finished, they put the remains of his body into eight separate black bin bags. And at this moment, Kathleen realised they would need help. So she called her ex-husband of 29 years, John, to tell him what had happened. He initially didn't believe them, and then he went to the flat to check. When he went to the flat, he eventually learned the events of the night. And he lost it. He told him he didn't want any part of this at all, and he left the apartment. This then left the three of them to clean the apartment of any evidence. But first, Linda and Charlotte, they were exhausted. So they took to the bedroom where they had just beaten Farley to death and they got some shut eye. This would then leave Linda to clean the bathroom head to toe. And when the girls would wake up, they helped her. And this went on into morning. The next morning on the 21st of March at 6am, the buzzer went off. The girls panicked. They were thinking who would be buzzing at the door at this hour on a bank holiday. And they thought they had been caught. But when they checked, they seen their dad, John Mulhall. He said he couldn't change what happened and he wanted to help his daughters and ex-wife out of this sticky situation. So he began helping them clean, packing all the bloodstained sheets and cloths into black bags that he brought out to his van. And he would later dispose them into a river. And at about 7am, Kathleen and the sisters then brought the body parts carried in sports bags except the head and the penis to the nearby Royal Canal and they dumped them in the water and stood there watching them sink to the bottom. They wanted to separate the body to make it harder to identify and piece together what had happened to her. On the same day, a few hours later, they intended to bring Farah's head back into Tala with them. So they found a small camera bag in Kathleen's apartment and they put his head into it. And from here, they made their way to get the bus to Tala. But first, they built up an appetite. So they stopped and they got a breakfast roll. This is a baguette filled with breakfast items like bacon, sausage, egg and maybe some red sauce or brown sauce. It's absolutely delicious all depending on where you get it from but it's very popular in Ireland. After this they then travelled by bus which would have taken them an hour. They then got off at the square shopping centre and walked through and they were seen on CCTV looking in shops and wandering around the shopping centre willy nilly. And when they were finished here, they made their way to a park beside the square shopping centre. They sat on a bench, thinking about where they would bury the head. And suddenly Charlotte began digging, and they buried the head very close to where they were sitting. They then left, going about their lives, as if nothing happened. Kathleen was seen on the days that followed making numerous trips to the shops, to buy cleaning supplies, to clean the remainder of her house. And later she would say the flat smelled horrific, which you can only imagine. On the evening of the 30th of March in 2005, a leg with a sock still attached to the foot was seen floating in the Royal Canal, close to the stadium Croke Park. A person who had seen the body originally thought it was a mannequin and someone trying to pull a prank. But when he got closer, he realised it wasn't a prank and he reported it to the Gardaí. The area was closed off as a crime scene, and divers then scoured the rest of the canal and found the remaining parts of his body, excluding the head and the penis. And this began the investigation, firstly into who the person was, as they could not identify him, or what had happened to him also. And they reached out to the public to try get some information to assist in piecing this puzzle together. And along with having a segment on the TV show Crime Call, there also was a large sum of reward money offered leading to any information who the person might be. As you can imagine, when the Mulhall women found out the body had been found, they were distraught. And when Linda found out, she wanted to move the head. So she made her way to the nearby Sean Walsh Memorial Park, carrying her son's school bike. And she dug up Farah's head and moved it to another field 40 minutes walk away. Where she broke it up with a hammer and reburied it. But some sources say she disposed of the head in multiple bins around the area. But this could not be confirmed. And to this day the head or the penis have never been found. 
Six weeks after the body was found, a witness recognised the t-shirt that was found on the torso. It was a long-sleeved Ireland football jersey, and the key witness was a Somalian man, and a friend of Farris named Ali. He had seen Farrell last in Dublin city centre on the 20th of March with the three Mulhall women. He stated Farrell was very intoxicated and he introduced him to the women. With this, on the 11th of July 2005, John Mulhall Jr., who was in Wheatfield Prison on traffic offences, he called the guardie from the prison on a smuggled phone. He said Farrell Noor had been killed and dismembered by his sisters, and Kathleen, his mother, had got the girls drunk and spiked Farrell's drink. He went on saying it was all part of an elaborate plan that her ex-husband John was also in on. He said Kathleen told him this while visiting him in prison. Investigators then with this information, they then went and checked the apartment in Summerhill where Kathleen and Farrell lived and they would find bloodstains belonging to Farrell. And this tightened the evidence they had against the family. It seems the trips Kathleen went on for the cleaning supplies was a waste of time. The Mulhall family were then all arrested on the 2nd of August. John, Kathleen, Charlotte and Linda were all arrested and questioned. They were each brought to separate guard stations and the evidence the guard has was put to them. They had the blood found in the apartment, the confession from John Jr and not to mention the sighting of them all together on O'Connell Street. However, this didn't stop them from denying any knowledge in the case. They were all held for 12 hours, questioned and then released. The Gardaí just didn't have enough evidence to send to the DPP, but they knew there was a weak link in the family, and the weak link was Linda. The Gardaí could see she was at her wit's end and she was just about to crack, so they kept pushing, and crack she did. Full of regret and guilt, she eventually made a phone call to the Gardaí, confessing to everything. Linda then brought the investigators to the park she buried his head, but there was nothing there and she couldn't explain it. Kathleen, Charlotte and John were then re-arrested and released on bail to await the trial. Awaiting the trial, Linda would return to the family home in Tala with her four kids and she began heavily drinking again and this left her dad John to care for the kids most of the time. And on the 8th of December 2005, John went out to the pub with some friends and family and when he came back to the house in Tala, he found Linda was heavily intoxicated and she started to begin an argument with him. She said her sister Charlotte stole money from her. John trying to keep the peace, he said he would go out and find Charlotte and return the money to her. So he left the house and John would never return home. He was found the next day in Phoenix Park by a jogger. John had ended his own life. Charlotte had given birth to a baby in May and the trial took place on October 12th, 2006, and they both pled not guilty to the charges put against them. And the nine day trial would feature graphic testimony from witnesses, including forensic experts who had examined the dismembered body parts. The defense team argued that the sisters had been provoked into committing the crime by far, stating the both girls had acted in self defense, hoping they would receive lesser sentences if found guilty. And on the 27th of October, Charlotte Mulhall was convicted of murder and she was given a life sentence. And Linda Mulhall was given manslaughter for her part in the brutal killing. And she was sentenced to 18 years, but she would only serve 15. The judge also felt she had shown remorse by coming forward with the confession. And both women were sent to serve out their time in Mountjoy prison. It wouldn't be long until they both were the main story in the papers again. Linda had cut her wrists while in prison and Charlotte had a photo taken that leaked of her holding a knife up to a male prisoner's neck, all while smiling. And this resulted in an increased security presence in all prisons in Ireland, and Charlotte was then moved from Mountjoy Prison to Limerick Prison as a result. Kathleen Mulhall fled to England before the trial had begun. She began calling herself Cathy Ward and had got a little council house in London where she would live for a while, but she was tracked down by a reporter and soon after, Gardie came knocking. She would return to Dublin voluntarily the next day, and as soon as she landed, she was arrested and charged with aiding and abetting the concealment of a crime. New charges were then added for withholding information in the case and helping clean up the crime scene. And in February 2009, 
Kathleen was sentenced to five years in prison for a part in the murder of Farah Noor, but she had already been in custody for two years, so this was backdated. Kathleen was then released after serving her time in October 2011, and she moved back over to England to live with her son James. And this arrangement would come under question by James's partner, which resulted in him stabbing his partner 12 times, and this led him to serve a lengthy jail sentence. Linda Mulhall was released from prison in January 2018. She was then tracked down to her new house in County Kildare. She told the reporter she wanted to be left alone so she could move on with her new life. Recently, as of March 2023, Charlotte Mulhall has been allowed to leave the prison for the day on certain days under prison supervision. And this is indicative of the path she is now on towards eventual permanent release from prison. This case shocked the Irish public and was also covered extensively by the international media. And it became a cautionary tale about the dangers of substance abuse and the consequences of violent behaviour. And it also added to the stereotype of Irish being alcoholics. After the murder, the sisters went on a shopping spree with Farrah's bank card, buying clothes, alcohol and other items. They withdrew cash on four separate occasions before his remains were found all while being caught on each of the ATM's CCTV footage. They were not the brightest tools in the shed at all. The Irish media duped the pair the Scissor Sisters. Thoughts go out to Farron North's family in Kenya and every one of the Mulhall family affected by this case. Thank you for watching. I will see you in the next one.